I often feel I, I have no right to be here. Um, apart from being a witness, as you say, it's over 20 years. Um, going um, to be I, I want to thank Mahmoud. I mean, after Mahmoud, it's very difficult to say anything. And I'm also, I have to say, deeply encouraged by the fact that now, unlike 20 years ago, we have parliamentarians who've been and who've seen and who feel it. Believe me, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, that was not the case. And even in academia, I find enormous amount of ignorance. Anyhow, most of you know, um, and I love what you said, because there's knowledge and there's heart knowledge as well, and thank you for that. So, okay, what I, I'm wit I am a witness. Um, I'm not the best one in the world, but I'm here, and I have been going for over 20 years, every year. Sometimes before 9-11, it was for, um, for two or three weeks. It was part of my job. I, I didn't take the contract of my university here in Australia without them agreeing to me going every year to Palestine. Um, after 9-11, our government has labelled all Palestinians as terrorists, and I'm not allowed to go. And I wonder if it's too late for me to hope someone, someone will uh, say that I'm not allowed to go to Palestine, the Australian government says I, I cannot, and my university acknowledges that. However, people go um, on holiday to Switzerland, which is much more dangerous if you ski. I've never seen anything dangerous in Ramallah or Bizet, never. Um, I have a very easy life when I go there. I live in a hotel now, and they drive me to this lovely university. I, I, anyhow, I'm not allowed to go there, but they cannot stop me going during my holidays. But it means that for the last 10 years, it's only been one week every year. Except last year when WHO sent me, um, strangely, to Gaza and to the West Bank and to East Jerusalem to look at, believe it or not, in 10 days, the mental health of Palestinians. Now, I know that's obscene, um, but I couldn't miss the opportunity. And my Palestinian friend said, well, better you than someone else. So I, I went and like David and others, although I've been traumatized before, I, I, um, I was deeply traumatized this time again. And in fact, I was there two months ago, at, and I bring this to your attention. Some of you may have heard of the Lancet Journal, Health Journal, it's one of the big health journals. Now, they have um, a, a conference every year on the health of Palestinians. And for me, I want to say that this is marvelous. I think we can build statues, perhaps, to um, Bar Barghouti, who's in prison, and to all the, the, the heroes of, of Palestine. We can see the memorials to Mahmoud Darwish, and these are fantastic. But what the Lancet has done, despite enormous opposition, is to publish scientific articles about the suffering, the health suffering of Palestinians. I do recommend it to you if, if you cannot sleep tonight. Just Google <laughs> the Lancet. You won't sleep better after this. But what's wonderful about it is nobody, you can pull a statue down, but you cannot change the kind of evidence that's in those journals, those articles. And every journal article gets peer peer-reviewed, peer-reviewed. These have been peer-reviewed and peer-reviewed and peer-reviewed because the scrutiny from the lobby, the Jewish lobby, I have to say, say it as it is, has been enormous to the extent that Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, had to fight for his job. There was an international campaign to get rid of him because he was publishing, publishing only what happens, not publishing fantast fantastic things. Anyhow, The Lancet, the health of Palestinians. I was there in March, and in my modest way, I want to acknowledge also the country in which we are now. So thank you for that, Dominic. And it's relevant to me because what could I do at such a conference? I've been at them before, but this time the conference, the Lancet conference, was in Palestine at my own university, at Birzeit University, where I am humbly a visiting professor. Um, and the conference was there, and I made a paper very, it will never be published, but it was comparing prisoners in Palestine to prisoners Aboriginal prisoners here, and every, people have said it. I mean, the empathy is enormous. Um, many years ago, my boss in Palestine, Professor in Birzeit, she came here, 
and I work a bit in Mount Druid with, Palestine, with the Aboriginal community. And she came, and just like you said, Aboriginal elders and Professor Jackman was like that, without, almost without words. Enormous empathy, enormous joy to be together and understanding one another, in a way which, like, I cannot understand Aboriginal people either. I've, I haven't felt dispossession the way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have, and we can never really feel the horrors of the Nakba, um, but we can do our best to empathise. OK, I, I don't want to go on too much. Um, I, I did mention that it was prisoners, and although, dare I say it, I also work a bit in suicide prevention here, a bit. It's men who kill themselves in Australia. Five men a day and one woman. One woman is terrible, five men a day is horrendous. But how many people are really interested in male suicide? And when we do think of it, we think, oh, well, it's young people. And even next week, I'm speaking at a conference, and they think that male, su male suicide means boys. It's not boys. It's men who kill themselves, both here, well, and we don't talk about it so much in Palestine. But all I'm saying is that although I love Palestine, and I'm very privileged to be there, um, men's health doesn't feature very largely. Understandably, we look at women's health, and of course I do, and, and children's health. But I beg you to think also of men's health. And 60%, at least, of the male population of Palestine has been in prison, uh, and is in prison, I mean, and suffers from that enormously. Some years ago, three years ago, I was in East Jerusalem, and I had been asked strangely by WHO in East Jerusalem to talk about the social determinants of health, because that's all I do in Palestine. Don't think I'm saying that they need me in Birzeit. I was there when we started those diploma and masters in public health, but they don't need me now. I go there because I want to go there, and it's some modest act of solidarity that people see someone from outside. But three years ago in East Jerusalem, WHO asked me to speak about um, the social determinants of health, which is strange because they invented this expression. It just means the context in which people live, where they work, where they live, where they suffer, where they love. So I did, and at the end of it, one of them, uh, an Egyptian WHO worker said, I believe you talk about men's health also, because here at Western Sydney, I run a small centre on men's health. And next week, and have to talk, it's International Men's Health Week, but I'll leave that aside for the moment. So speaking about, she said, you speak about men's health? And I said, well, yes. That very week, Israel had said, said they were going to release 1,000 men back into the community. 1,000 men? And I said, surely that's a public health issue. Surely, whatever we think about men and gender politics or whatever, surely compassion and professional acumen would make us say a thousand men back from sometimes 10 years, 14 years, maybe only six months, all of them traumatized um, being in prison back into the community. Surely that's a public health issue. And then I'm saying this, I hope you feel the love I'm saying this for my WHO colleagues, my Arab colleagues. This beautiful woman stood up and said, oh yes, they're poor wives. Now she's right, of course. Those women who have to be the sexual partners, the psychologists, the support workers the, of, of these men, that's sure. But what about the men themselves? Yeah. So I was really delighted and that you're going to, you talked about the, the, getting some money for those prisons organizations. That's the first time I've heard anybody <laughs> in Australia talk like this. Uh, for me, it's a bit emotional it's a, to hear that there is this support, growing support, because I remember Julie Irwin trying to raise the issue of Palestinians in parliament, and the Labour Party said to her, sit down, we are always and everywhere friends of Israel. Now, I find that obscene. I, of course we're friends of Israel. But, of course, uh, to call me anti-Semitic is crazy. I'm not anti As they say, some of my best friends uh, are Jewish. No, it's, but to say that, that you can't be friends of Palestine. Um, OK, I began this journey of, it's actually 24 years, in Gaza. I used to teach in England, and one of my Palestinian students from Gaza invited me to a mental health conference in Gaza, where I spoke of him. Um, Dr. Ayad El Saraj, the psychiatrist around community mental health in Gaza, and I gave my little talk on primary health care and mental health, very superficial. But then um, 
at one point an Israeli psychiatrist, I'm going to tell this story even though, I know, take it for what it is, it's a true story. An Israeli psychiatrist stood up and said, we Palestinians, you, you Palestinians and we Israelis, we must learn to be divorced and to respect one another like divorced people. And at the point, I was even more naive then than I am now. Um, uh, then a psychologist from Birzeit actually stood up and said, thank you very much, it's very nice you're here, to, and I hear what you're saying about marriage and divorce, but there was never a marriage. There was a rape, <laughs> and he sat down. I'm sorry to say it, but if, if I have the, the, the temerity to talk of rape uh, as a man, etc. Nevertheless, I think if ever there is to be a reconciliation between a man who's raped a woman and a woman who's been raped, the first thing would be surely the acknowledgement of the abuse. And that doesn't happen. That's not happening. I don't hear many. Of course, there's wonderful people like in Pape and others, of course, acknowledging this. And Recording, I mean, record Elon Pappy's, the, the genocide story. I mean, the village you talk about is he meticulously details village after village from Israeli scripts about the obscenity of the ongoing Nakba. Okay, you all know it's, it's Nakba, but it's not finished. I was lucky to be there again at this conference. Last year, WHO sent me to Gaza. This year, I was at the Lancet conference in Birzeit. Sometimes it's in Jordan and Egypt, but this time it was in Birzeit. And I'm staying in a big fancy hotel. People think, oh, you go to Palestine, it must be difficult. There's no fan when I first went 24 years ago, okay, it was a bit rough and ready. But I'm from <laughs> Glasgow in Scotland, so I know rough and ready. Now, uh, I was staying in a fancy hotel, and there's a car that takes me out to a lovely university outside Ramallah, which is Birzeit. So, but some women had brought their artifacts to sell to development tourists like me, or whatever you like to call us. And um, one woman produced this beautiful handicraft object, artifact, with the word Hebron, Hebron on it. And I bought it. Because if you haven't been to Hebron, you have been to Hebron, then that's the epitome of the ongoing Nakba for me. And anybody who's been to Hebron cannot possibly say this is not obscene, cannot possibly say this is not a rape of a country. In the marketplace you walk along and there's a net going between the shops. And of course, Muggins says, well, me, what's that for? And the people smile and say, that's because these, the Israelis who built the, the settlements just above the marketplace throw rubbish on top of the Palestinians every day. And so the, the, the net stops it. It stops the solids, it doesn't stop the liquids, yeah? I mean, so I've got this little sign, and I've got it outside my door at home in the Blue Mountains, the lovely Blue Mountains, um, so that I don't forget. It's so easy to be there in Palestine and to come back to my nice, comfortable life and to forget the suffering of Palestinians, and I don't want to forget. So thank you for having me. The, what, what else can I say about that? Um, I'm going to name names. When I came back last year from my very superficial trip to Gaza and the West Bank, where, where you, you do, know, I suppose you know the story, I'm sorry for those of you who do, where Israel is digging underneath the houses in East Jerusalem, saying that they're looking for the Garden of David. And so Palestinian houses are collapsing. Um, it's true, not one or two, but hundreds of houses are collapsing in the name of looking for our, our heritage, our land, our David's garden, and those, who cares, who, who's, who's interested in that? That's what strikes me, has always struck me. I'm so glad to see you here. Obviously there is a growing interest, but it is small, David. It's a small interest, and I'm going to name names. When I came back from Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem last year, I tried to go on to Q&A to have a question <laughs> about Q&A, and it was going to be a very modest question. It was just going to say, does the panel agree that one can be critical of Israel and its policies without being anti-Semitic? Which is so obvious, but if ever you raise this issue, I'm, one gets accused of being anti-Semitic. So they didn't let me ask the question. But 
without any provocation or any stimulation, Tanya Plibersek, whom I had once thought would be a great prime minister for us, I no longer think that because of this. She said spontaneously, these young people now going into, in Palestine, in Israel, and who are taking scissors and they're stabbing policemen. And then they're turning to face, they, st they stab anybody, but then they're turning to face the policemen in order to be shot, to be killed. And then they're not shooting their legs, they're shooting the t to kill. Those young people, Tanya Plibersek said, well, this is terrorism, this is the third intifada. That's culpable ignorance. Culpable ignorance. Nobody, in, especially in a position of authority, has any right to say that those young people now, out of frustration that nothing's happening on their behalf, turn to get killed. They've done something, something meaningful. God help them. Um, to say that this is the third intifada, that's shocking. I wrote to her, <laughs> I wrote to her of course, and um, of course, you, you know, you get letters back. Okay. Okay. Um, what can, I, what can I say, really, except that I feel enormous privilege to be a witness. The last thing I'll say, and you can please shut me up, but because I could go on. It's because it's superficial, my visit. It was longer before, but now it's this just one week a year, maybe two times a year if, if my children allow me to take holidays and not be with. That's been a, a family problem. Why are you going there again? <laughs> um, and I took my son three years ago, and that helped a lot. You spoke of Calandia. My son kept saying, Dad, you must see the two points. There's two points of view here. You know, there's, there's really sort of a point of view. Amnesty said the same to me. Would I come and talk about Palestine while they looked for the Palestinian situation? I'm not an expert. But they were finding an Israeli to talk about the Israeli point of view. And I said, well, um, I gave the rape story. I said, um, if you've got a rapist and a, someone who's been raped, and you, you need to hear two stories. I'm not going to talk there. That's, that's, and, but my son always says, there's two points of view, Dad. He's a bright young man, and he came with me, and he went through Kalandia. And he was stopped because he was going through the wrong cattle grid. He had a bag, a trendy young man with a bag, yeah? And he was in the line which shouldn't have a bag, yeah? And he said, Dad, come here, Dad. I said, come. No, he wouldn't. So he, he got through because you have to, the cattle grids, they let you through, but you cannot come back, those of you who know. So he got through, and then the young lady with a gun shouted at him and get back, but he couldn't get back. He, he was, in his own little way, traumatized. So after five minutes, he came and joined us in the queue, and he, he then, he no longer says, I'm, his dad is unbalanced. And, and okay, if I'm unbalanced, I don't mind being unbalanced, if that's the case. Look, you, you can hear the kind of stories I have. The last one maybe was when I was, as I say, even more naive. This is when it happened for me, going into Damascus Gate, going to Jerusalem. I used to be a Christian, so I was happy to be in the Via Dolorosa, where you see um, lots of Italian Christians who have no idea that there are Palestinian Christians. No idea. And they're walking, doing the, and good, good for them. They're doing the Via Dolorosa, remembering the Stations of the Cross, etc. So I was walking, and I was respectful of that. But just at the Damascus Gate, at the entrance to Old Jerusalem, there was a Palestinian woman completely traumatized, sitting on the ground um, with her child. And she had done something wrong. And she was being terrorized by two soldiers with guns. Now, they weren't going to shoot her, but they were really abusing her. And they went on and on and on and on. And I don't speak Hebrew, and my Arabic is very bad. <laughs> but um, I tell you, at one point, <laughs> I got so it's never happened to me before. I felt, I felt I could have killed those soldiers. I mean, that's a horrible thing to say. But the frustration of that woman who wasn't able to do anything, and she was just sitting there with her baby, and um, there was a crowd around her, and the soldiers were abusing her for something. I felt, well, I could get through there. They'd, I don't look Palestinian. But <laughs> so I could, get to, I could do something to them. And that's the first time I've ever felt that kind of aggression. And that, I'll finish with that by saying, we sometimes talk of Shumud, this resilience of Palestinians. And it's been overdone. How can you be resilient after 69 years? But some still are. And I'll finish with the, what my boss in Palestine, the professor, says, Rita Jackman, she says, we're not optimists here, John, and we're not pessimists. We're pess optimists. They've kept some kind of hope going in this terrible situation. And you give me hope, and I'm very proud to be and glad to be here. Thank you so much.